and we're live. Welcome back to my show, everyone. Um, I have with me here uh, a really uh, tender-hearted and precious guest that I've met on Facebook. His name is Sean Luke. Welcome, Sean. Hey, it's good to be here, Eric. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I appreciate you coming on here. Um, so uh, he is a an Anglican. He's a student over at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And uh, we're going to be dialoguing on my book, uh, The Just Shall Live by Faith, which is um, my attempt at trying to resolve the uh, the doctrine of justification, the debate, actually, between Catholics and Protestants um, on this very um, precious and contentious issue. And uh, I'm going to allow Sean to introduce himself a little bit more. And then we'll take it from there. So, Sean, why don't you give us a little bit more of your background? Yeah, sure. Well, so, yeah, as Eric mentioned, I'm a student at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, finishing up my last semester um, with a Master's of Divinity and a Master's in Systematic Theology. Um, I was not a Christian my whole life. Um, my mother was a Christian. Um, I I was sort of, I call myself sort of a closet agnostic. Um, my father wasn't and still isn't. Um and the Lord met me uh, when I was 16. And uh, to make a long, short story short, which I'll tell over on my channel, <laughs> um, I I came to know the Lord and absolutely fell in love with theology and scripture and trying to see God's beauty in those things um, and trying to gain clarity over who he is. Uh, I began my Christian life as a Baptist. <laughs> um, so I was not always an Anglican. Um I became an Anglican in around, at around 2019, actually. Um, I was sort of a Baptist, but a high sacramental Baptist for the longest time because of what I saw in scripture. Um, something along the London Baptist Confession, but a little bit uh, more sacramental. Um, and I became a convinced uh, pedo-Baptist uh, three years ago uh, during Easter, actually. I'd been wrestling with it for a year and um, then I saw, uh, like, I and I came to the conclusion that the arguments were pretty solid. But you know, it's when you're a Baptist, if you've been in that world, it's hard yeah. to see a baby baptized and yeah. and mm -hmm. you know accept it. I understand. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I, I believe you were a Reformed Baptist, which actually, I was. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, and uh, I I came to accept it that Easter. Uh, and I saw for the first time was able to welcome these precious little children into the family of God in good conscience. Um, yeah. So I've been an Anglican since my long-term goals, hopefully will be to do a PhD after my wife does her master's uh, and to figure out how that meshes together with uh, ministry within conservative Orthodox Anglicanism, um, a, a unity of Anglican provinces called GAFCON, which is the global like, yeah. Anglican future conference. Um, yeah. So Little bit yeah, about me. that's great. That's great, man. I uh, yes, I was a Reformed Baptist for years, and I did hold to the London Baptist Confession of Faith. Um, one of my heroes, and I would stay, I would say he's one of, he's still one of my heroes, is uh, D. A. Carson, who taught yeah. for many years at Trinity, uh, at Trinity Evangelical, um, and Douglas Moo as well. Um, but yeah, I too, um, sort of. Uh, set sail across the horizon you could say and made it into the anglican church i was part of the apa the anglican province of america oh, yeah. on the yeah. northeast coast yeah. under bishop grundorf a wonderful man yeah. and so i was able to pitch tent there as i as i call it now um and it was a wonderful time uh, the the people there were awesome um the rector there um at the anglican parish i was attending um, high sacramental views. Um, but you know, it was, it was, we had members there that didn't share those views, but in any case, we are going to go, uh, with Sean going first with, um, you know, his take, he actually read my book. Um, and so he's going to kind of go into that a little bit talk about justification and then we're just going to kind of go back and forth um we don't have a set structure here um many of my listeners know that's my preference i, I kind of just have a free for all and sean's free to ask me anything he'd like and um and he'll take my questions as well all in charity so we'll go ahead and you go sean and um 
and uh, take as long as you'd like, really. I'm really patient. So go ahead. Awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah. So what I'd like to do to start out is just sort of lay out my view of uh, justification, what I take to be the broadly reformed Anglican view of justification, um, because there are, as Eric's noted, like there are several views of, of justification, even in Protestant circles and the Lutheran and re reformed view are not exactly the same. Um, Anglicanism, just as a little bit of background, is conceived as a via media, not just between Protestantism and Rome, um, but also actually primarily and first between Wittenberg and Geneva. That's right. Um, and so the, the view I take really is sort of a meshing together of those views. Um, sort of, if you've read Martin Bucer, um, pretty much tracking with Bucer. Yep. So uh, what does it mean to be justified? Well, I think it means, as again, you can find this a really good definition of the Protestant view in Eric's book, um, that we are declared to be in the right before God justification in that sense for the protestant is fundamentally within a covenantal law court framework it describes god finding in the right for his people and so the question is okay on what basis does god find me in the right and what are sort of the consequences of being found in the right well to take the second question first if i'm found in the right that means i'm entitled to all of the covenant blessings the covenant blessings are mine they will be poured out all my life in the new covenant, that's the blessing of eternal life. It's the blessing of relationship with God, the resurrection of the body, the life of the world to come. Um, and so we believe that we have a title uh, to eternal life by faith alone. And I'll, I'll clarify that phrase by faith alone in a little bit. Um, so, um, so it's fundamentally set within a law court. Second, uh, it's set within the context of union with Christ. So, we, we talk about terms like imputation and infusion, and Eric and I will probably talk more about those terms. But first, I sort of want to set that in its right context. For Protestants, for Reformed Anglicans, uh, sort of walking the line again between Lutheranism and Reformed theology, uh, we would argue that faith receives Christ. So by faith in Christ, namely that God raised him from the dead, and by the confession, which is embodied in a confession of Jesus as Lord, as the one to whom you orient your life, you are united to Jesus. The Holy Spirit in whom Christ dwells because of perichoresis, what we, we call it, the indwelling of the persons. The Spirit in whom Christ dwells, dwells in our hearts. So we're united to Christ through the Spirit. And in being united to Christ, we receive all of the blessings of being united to Christ in a definitive way. So Calvin, for example, talks about the inseparability of justification and the renewal of the interior man, such that you can even say, if one is not justified, you are not renewed. Uh, now, that is not to say that they're the same thing. We, we, we deny that they're the same thing as Protestants. But what we do want to say is that justification identifies a particular aspect of our union with Christ. And because justification is dependent on union with Christ, that's why you can't separate uh, justification from sanctification, although you can distinguish them. Um, you, you get both of those blessings at once. So Calvin and uh, Bucer and even Luther in Two Kinds of Righteousness talks about how when you receive Christ, you really are renewed. That is a part of your being united to Christ. But justification identifies a particular aspect, namely you being in the right. And we argue as Protestants that that is not on the basis of the interior renewal that accompanies justification. So there is an interior renewal that accompanies justification such that you can say, if you are justified, then you are renewed. Those two things are inseparable. But if uh, the basis, the cause of justification is our union with Christ and our sharing the verdict pronounced over Jesus in the final resurrect, in his resurrection rather, and so this is also a key difference between sort of the Lutheran and Reformed views is that the, the Lutheran view and Anglicanism kind of follows that route. They'll talk about the imputation of Christ's active and passive obedience, if you've ever heard those terms. Um, the imputation of Christ's active obedience being positively, what did he do in by way of keeping the law in his life? His passive obedience, what did he do to make satisfaction for us through his sufferings, what he received? Those, so... The reformed sort of harp on the point that those both are imputed to you, and that's you know that's that's fine. But 
uh, Anglicans and, and Lutherans sort of want to tweak the categories a little bit and say, I think it's better to talk about Jesus's justification at the resurrection, at his resurrection, being the consequence of Jesus, uh, his, his keeping the law perfectly, both his perfect death and his perfect life. But it's not the case that I am counted as though I healed the lepers that Jesus healed, because that doesn't make sense. <laughs> uh, but rather, it's the case that I share in the status pronounced over Jesus through my union with him, forged by the Holy Spirit. And so imputation, then, is the declaration that Sean or Eric, are they are, as a result of being in Christ, participants in the verdict that God pronounced over the Son at the resurrection. That's really key, because that's going to factor in, I'm sure, to our discussion about, um, especially at the end of Romans 4, that Jesus is delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And it's going to factor into conversations about um, whether you can be justified without being, while still being a, a sinner in rebellion against the Holy God. Uh, the short answer is both Eric and I will say no <laughs> to that question. Um, but what we'll want to say is that the grounds for uh, of our being accepted in the right will articulate the answer to that question a little bit differently. So I hope that that's brief enough. And I hope that's, that's helpful by way of explaining how we're thinking about imputation, especially as reformed Anglicans. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sean. Yeah, that's, um, that, that's a very good um, synopsis of the issue. And I want to, I want to make it clear that uh, it, one of the largest uh, caricatures and misrepresentations that Catholics make is that Protestants, Protestant theology, and here I'm going to refer to both Luther and Calvin and their trajectories into the Confessions, uh, Book of Concord, um, the uh, the Presbyterian Confessions, the Baptist Confessions, um, I mean, the Methodist Church thing. I mean, this is just all, it's replete in all of the of, of Protestant theology. Um, they, they do not teach that you are justified by faith alone in such a in such a way that you don't have there is no change in the person. Um, I think that the inseparability that you that you spoke about between justification and sanctification um, for Protestants is is a it's it's dogmatic really. I mean it's 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 being it's held by all of them. Uh, Luther is often looked at as some that you know this this uh, man who needed you know. Just uh, he needed to be at e at ease and find peace with God through a vicarious substitute, so that he didn't have to worry about his behavior. And um, you know, there, there's the um, there's the statements which I, to this day I've never myself read Luther writing that uh, the the snow covered dung hill, or I, I've not actually seen that. He may have written that. I've never seen it myself, but he's often uh, quoted in with with that citation. Um, to try and give off this impression that um, the interior life, obedience, keeping the law of God is really, um, it's good, but not necessary. And that's just not the right Protestant view. Yeah. Um, but in the, the Catholic view, you know, as I t chart down in my book, um, the, the Catholic view um, definitely does share a lot with what you just said. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you read Aquinas, for example, he he takes this view this the, this view that Jesus Christ in his in his uh, that that hypostatic union between divinity and humanity um, acted as a corporate person. So we you'll learn that you know I'm sure you've learned this at Trinity this idea of corporate identity. Mm -hmm. you, you get it all back in the Hebrew Semitic world. Um, where someone does something in such a way that it, it yields good for the corporate body that is being represented. And we, uh, we definitely believe that when Christ suffered on the cross and, uh, well, you know, when he, when, when he, when he took on the mir miracle of the incarnation, um, including that as well, uh, but all the way through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, that those redemptive events were corporate representations of what is going to yield true for all of human beings who 
end up uniting with him in the wow. baptismal union uh, that Romans 6 talks about. So Aquinas and the Catholic Church would say that he was obedient until death. Philippians 2 says that uh, Romans uh, 5, 18 to 19 uh, speak about the second Adam living in obedience to the Father. And as a result of that, um, those who are under his representation are reckoned righteous. So the question here is, he definitely merited for himself, okay, the gift of eternal life. So through, by his passion, his, you know, through his obedience, call it active, passive, if you'd like, um, he was rewarded and crowned mm -hmm. with everlasting life, dominion over all things. Okay. So when we are baptized into him, we are sort of co-crowned with him. In other words, when we are baptized into him as a living member of his body, all of the winnings, all of the trophies, all of the earnings that was procured by the head flow down into all of the members of the body. So in Catholic theology, we would definitely accept that. Okay, so so we're, we're on track there with that imagery. And here's where I think we're going to differ, is that as a living body member, when those graces come penetrate to me, when they come to me, okay, what is the effect in me that comprises the gift of justification? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You well said. Yeah. <laughs> so this is where we would differ. The, what you were saying is that what we receive in union with Christ are, it's multi-aspectival there's mm -hmm. different realities that all come simultaneously. Um, one of the statements you made reminds me a lot of uh, uh, the work of, uh, I like to call them the, the trio, Voss, Ritter, Boss, and Gaffin, because yeah. uh, they, they were so important in my own uh, learning when I was a Protestant. But Gaffin emphasizes uh, this resurrection of Jesus you know, sort of being his own vindicating justification before heaven, before God, before humanity. And um, so he sort of plunges, you know, Christ plunges into the depths of human, the human world, becoming in the likeness of sinful flesh. Um, but through the crucifixion and out of the tomb, you've got this, you know, all of the work of sin has been cleaned up, you know, all the work that needed to be done to save the world and, and, and the, um, the rectification that guilt required all those things, even within his own person, not that he was imputed guilt, that'd be another s subject, but mm -hmm. through his resurrection, he comes out, um, from the place of the guilty, the place of the damned. Uh, and not the damned, meaning he was damned. We would say he comes out of death into life. And Gaffin emphasized how union with Christ is really union with the resurrection of Christ, such that we join in with his winnings. And I like that imagery. But uh, Catholics would say that the distinction between justification and sanctification um, is is not one that it, it's understandable. Like so, Luther's uh, Luther's eventual, um, you know, his eventual emphases on the distinction between justification, and sanctification, and Calvin's as well. Mm -hmm. um, we would say that it makes sense. It's coherent. It's not that it doesn't make sense. It makes perfect sense. Um, in fact, there is a way to bridge that with Catholic theology. I tried to do this in the introduction between when I distinguish between the act of justification and the habit of justification, mm -hmm. where I said that the act of justification is that momentary translation that takes place in regeneration, in baptism. So when that happens, like so what, when a baby is translated from adam to christ he he literally gets co-crowned 
with Christ, such that if he were to pass from this life, he would he would walk into uh, and be prepared for the kingdom of God, just like just like his elder brother Christ mm -hmm. um, uh, has his place uh, there at the right hand of God. So there's a lot a lot of overlap here, but what we would say is that justification itself, that distinction. Um, would require some exegetical um, delineation because we can we can say that justification has that law court imagery, um, but there's one passage in scripture where I think this comes out the most, and then I'm going to pass it right back to you, uh, Sean. In um, the book of the Colossians, Paul's Paul's a letter letter to the Colossians. Um, chapter one i've got my uh i still have my john MacArthur study bible here wow. king james <laughs> which so the, the irony of that is i'm actually using the catholic bible <laughs> oh yeah that's ironic that's ironic uh I'm, I'm sure we'll get some comments on that um okay so colossians one um colossians one verse yes 21 to 22 And um, St. Paul says in Colossians 1, 21, And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Okay. So, You've got this alienation, okay? This alienation and this enmity, okay? That exists in the mind by wicked works, okay? And the contrast to that, or the 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 transitioning verb is reconciled, reconciliation, okay? You were once alienated, right? And enmity, enemies, and then you're now reconciled, okay? And this is that, I, I brought this out, I think, in... Um, in one of the chapters in my book, the the similarity between justification and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Okay, now reconciliation requires a double solution to its problem of alienation. So alienation gives us guilt. Okay, we have to answer for our actions, like uh, Paul Paul says elsewhere. The the handwriting of requirements, um, then. Then it, there's the alienation itself, the darkening of the mind, you see. And so if if the alienation and the enmity, being enemies with, with our creator, is not just, uh, it, it's not just one aspect, the legal aspect. It's both the condition of the mind and the consequent uh, legal uh, penalty, the guilt of sin, then that means that the, the 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 healing of that alienation, which takes place in reconciliation, would would be a healing to both sides. Sure. And so, and so we would we would say justification and reconciliation in this sense um, largely intersect. Okay, even though they're metaphorically they they have different image imagery. But the the action itself that we're talking about reconciliation justification, which 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 really comes out in Romans five, uh, verse mm -hmm. nine to eleven, we would say it's 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 the same mechanic. Okay, so justification definitely involves the um, the the removal of guilt. In other words, um, the annihilation of all charges that could be brought against us um, to to impute guilt against us okay that's all washed away in the gift of justification but okay there's also the mind becoming alive because if the mm -hmm. mind does not come alive um to god this is you know paul talks about al being alive to god um and i understand reform believe that we, you know that that was made that was made very clear in your presentation you know, and and all the Catholic listeners here need to take note, okay? When 
Protestants believe regeneration, it reformed, and some I I I I'm not sure Luther held this, but I think he did. That mm -hmm. regeneration precedes uh, justification, but I think Luther put them together. Um, but uh, reformed guys, Calvin would say regeneration precedes justification. So they definitely they definitely believe that the sinner be, needs to be made alive to God, and what that what that involves in Romans six is is joining with the new life of Jesus out of his tomb. Um, which has ethical implications. It it's 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 it has the implication for the disposition of the heart. Okay, so before we do any activities, we are renewed in heart and mind. And you know, scripture heart and mind are kind of like uh, synonymous. So when both of those things are done, the the heart is renewed and disposed to love God, and when all of one's sins are forgiven. Okay, that person is no longer an enemy of God. Okay, um, they are now justified. So we could use the law court imagery, but um, the effect of joining and unionizing with Christ is that twofold solution. So we would say justification is involves both aspects you know the catechism says that it's both the forgiveness of sins and the interior renewal of the inward man rectifying the soul and bringing it to god um disposed to god so we so last point here we would just say that um it's it, that interior process that interior renewal um is part of you you guys would relegate it to another room in the hotel so if you got a a big hotel with many rooms um you guys think there's one room for justification that's the legal the recognition that whatever whatever status jesus has you have when it comes to the ontological renewal that's a different room in the hotel it's in the hotel of union with christ but it's two different rooms Whereas we would say that there aren't two different rooms um, in that sense. So sanctification, positional sanctification, as you you studying systematic theology, you know what that is. Um, that that too is uh, synonymous with justification. Um, but we can still take the law court imagery. So tell tell me yeah. what you think on that, and yeah. tell me tell me if you saw, re remember anything in my book yes. that stuck yeah. out about that. Yeah. So so I have two things. Um, so would you say Calvin's duplex gratia would be subsumed under justification for uh, for the Roman Catholic position? So the only difference I would say exists here is that in Catholic theology, you know, the forgiveness of sins. Um, is not like uh, it comes through regeneration. In other words, it, it comes through our participation in the death of Jesus. So when, when Jesus died on the cross, that was like the day of judgment breaking into the present there. Um, on, you know, when he died on the cross, all of our sins were, were judged and, and, and satisfied. The wrath of God was satisfied. Um, the interior renewal is actually not a practical righteousness just yet. Okay. So, um, you'll have to remind me on Calvin's doctrine, because uh, it's my understanding that Calvin's doctrine of the duplex is that, you know, both the imputed righteousness and the progressive sanctifying righteousness that we acquire through behavior. So he would actually want to say that, um, th there's actually a decisive interior renewal that turns you from being even onto like in your heart from being dead to alive to God, where your affections are reordered. So, like, he actually takes for the duplex gratia phrase for him, it's the simultaneity of both being declared in the right and being given a new nature. Yes, yes, yes. So, we we would say that, um, the new nature is actually primary. And is what gives both effect to forgiveness of sin yeah. and the re and the renewal. So it's not like as if there's a, a metaphysical 
um, just, you know, a real distinction, like God forgives your sins and then also um, renews you. It's not quite like that. It's through regeneration. We literally, um, we are, we are dead in Adam. Our, Our Adamic life is dead and the Christic life is born. And, and our life is no longer ours, like Paul says in Galatians 2. It is no longer I who live, um, but Christ who lives in me. That's kind of forensic language, but it's also ontological. Um, so for Paul, we would say that um, dying to the law through the body of Christ and being raised with Christ, that is primary. And out of that comes the two effects where we're... we're we're regenerated, and as a result of being regenerated, we're justified by being made new. So, yes, what Calvin say was saying about the ontological renewal, and um, our Adamic life has already been answered in the cross. So, all the guilt of our past is is paid for. Okay, so let me see then if I understand sort of the Catholic position right, and then for our listeners, try to articulate some of the differences, and yeah. tell me if I'm, because I, I don't want to knock down a straw man, um, yeah, no, so yes. tell me if it sounds right. Um, so my understanding of, like, how a Roman Catholic would talk about someone's position prior to baptism, just, you know, assuming that either they don't come from a Christian household or they don't have faith, um, is that they're under, they've accrued by their sin the eternal debt of punishment, and that in baptism, uh, they are renewed, converted, uh, given a new nature, and on the basis of God's infused grace, which is the grace of Christ. It is Christ's holiness, his holiness being infused into the heart of the baptized. Uh, but through that infusion and on that basis of that person being made a new creation, the eternal debt of punishment. I'm just going to turn off my AC really quick. No, that, that take your time. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so uh, on that basis... Um, of the renewal that happens to the creature through baptism, um, that the eternal debt of punishment is lifted. They're made completely new. Now, they might, like, as they grow in their life, um, their Christian life, they might sin. Um, There are venial and mortal sins. When you commit a venial sin, that doesn't accrue the eternal debt of punishment, um, but that does accrue a temporal debt of punishment. Um, and for temporal debts, you, you, that's that's where you sort of make satisfaction. But if if you do cre- if you do commit a mortal sin, uh, then you go to a priest. Um, you've accrued the eternal debt of punishment, and you go to a priest. Uh, the priest per- you confess your sins, and with uh, with contrition, with genuine, authentic contrition, which means you know, hating the sin for its own sake and loving God, um, even if imperfectly, even if the, I believe it's. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe imperfect contrition counts, I think. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so if that's mingled with like the fear of punishment, of eternal punishment, like that's imperfect because you should hate sin for its own sake. Um, but it's it's still enough to obtain forgiveness um, from the Lord uh, through the priest as the priest pronounces absolution. And then the priest will sign a penance. So the eternal debt of punishment is removed. You're not going to hell once you've received absolution prior to doing any works of penance. But then when you do penance, that's to satis- to make satisfaction for uh, what's called the temporal debts of punishment. Uh, so that, that involves healing, both healing the wounds created in our soul by sin, uh, and it involves uh, expiating the, the punishment. So in the Council of Trent, uh, my impression is that they address actually sort of, is it just medicinal? And it's both medicinal and it makes satisfaction for the temporal debt of punishment. Yes. Um, so uh, the way I see that then factoring into this discussion is Cal- because there's a lot of overlap. And often I was listening to the debate between Jimmy Aiken and Jordan Cooper. And it's oh, often yeah. hard in discussions like <laughs> to sort of just yeah. really hone down and focus on the differences. And like, you know, I, I love I believe genuine ec- uh, ecumenicism with Roman Catholic brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, both involves an affirmation and celebration of our, our of our you know similarities, but our, our precise articulation of our differences. So I'm going to try sure. to do that. But yeah. so far, is that a fair summary? Yeah, I you know um, that that's so far everything you've said sounds like it's it's uh, it's it was done well. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, the key difference, and Eric, you you actually articulated this I think well in your book. 
the key difference is uh, on what basis uh, does God accept this? So, like, we can we can even step back from like the terminology ter terminology of justification and sanctification, and ask sort of like the uh, a more semantic or theological question: On what basis does God give me the right to eternal life? Right, whatever we call that. <laughs> or what what basis does God give me that title? And I think for the Roman Catholic, and correct me if I'm wrong, it'll be, yes, the, the cause of that, sort of a, a broader cause will be, yeah, baptism, but directly in the soul, um, it, the, the cause of God's even giving the title to us will depend on the interior infused grace uh, of Christ into the soul, uh, such that, and, and this is where a concern for Protestants, this is where the concern would come, such that when one is sort of like living, not living in sin, but let's say they've committed a string of venial sins, Trent commends um, this uh, a kind of doubt towards your salvation. Now, now I want to be clear here because this gets misrepresented on the part of Protestants towards Roman Catholics. Trent isn't saying you can't have any any confidence whatsoever, and you're utterly in the dark whether you're saved or not. That's not what that's saying. But there is um, a sense of commending, I would say, uncertainty. And, and the basis for that is when we consider our own faults, that sort of gives a ground for being hesitant. And that particular aspect, when the consideration of our own faults is what Protestants would want to want to object to and nuance and say, the basis of our being a child of God is not our renewal. Uh, so the, that that's, I think, between you and I, that's going to be the central question. What's what's the basis of our receiving the right to eternal life and being an heir? Is it that interior transformation um, or, well, Protestants would agree, interior transformation happens, um, or is it participation in that status of Christ pronounced over him at the resurrection, credited to all of those who are in him? Yes, you're getting right to the heart of the issue. I thank you so much for articulating that very well. So here I think it would be very important to get to this issue of grounds or basis, like you ask, okay? Because in, in, in Catholic theology, we talk about it in terms of causes or principles, okay? The principles of justification or the causes of justification. And you seem familiar with the Council of Trent, so you would know that um, in the sixth session that there was a variety of causes to the gift of justification. So let's picture the gift of justification uh, requiring a cost. Like what's the cost of getting us justified in the eyes of God? And in Catholic theology, we have one answer to that question, okay? And that is the death of Jesus. Okay, so, the, you know, what God himself did with no human help in Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection, okay, so both, both the, the, the sacrificial, the, the will of Christ in taking on the obedience, right? He said, um, he said, not my will, but your, wills be, your will be done. Okay, so that love, so it wasn't like uh, it wasn't the liquid blood that actually it's 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 it was his intention, his will, his obedience to death. You know that action plus the the powerful new life that was put into the corpse of Christ. Okay, those two things don't have any human help. There's no hands involved there, like Paul says, circumcision without hands. This is the circumcision without hands, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, a real human death and a real new tr supernatural resurrection, okay? That's the cost of our justification, okay? So when the Council of, Council of Trent talks about the meritorious cause of justification is the passion and death of Christ. So that's the short answer to that. Now, now, there's when when we talk about the gift coming to us and being appropriated to us it takes on a certain form and this is what the council fathers called the formal cause you know 
taking from the Aristotelian framework of thought. So you have merit, the cost. In other words, Christ paid all the, he paid, he paid the cost, the ransom um, in full. Okay. We don't add a crumb to, to cite Calvin. He liked to call it crumb, you know, not a crumb of human works um, can be added to that. Not a single coin from human work can be added to that. Um, but when, when God dispenses the gift of justification, which means that, like you said, when we, un- when we unite with Christ and the gift of the head comes down to all the members of his body, it takes on a certain form, which is a formal cause. That formal cause is the righteousness of God infused into us, okay, which is the, the virtues infused into us, faith, hope, and love, okay? And, and that's still before any human activity is done. So we're still, uh, if, we're, if, we're, if we're tracking here, mm-hmm. that's still before any human good work is done, yeah. okay? Um, but if we're going to extend the time so that we're going into the post-baptismal life of a person, then there's the cooperative will with the grace now received, which, which definitely will involve making choices and doing works that, that cooperate with the gift of justification that's been given to you. Okay, so... When we talk about grounds of our right standing before God, Catholics are thinking meritorious cause, in which okay. case we're, we're going right back to the cross. Right, okay? right. But when we're talking about, but, but because there's a form that's that's necessary yeah. as a re, by way of reception of the gift, we would say that there's another kind of cause to our right standing before God, namely the form that it takes when we yeah. get it. So, so maybe this might be a helpful way. If I'm articulating that sort of in Catholic terms, the, the Protestant perspective is that the formal cause would be our union with Christ and the, or more particularly our participation in the status of pronounced over Jesus through our union with Christ. That, yeah, I, yeah, I think so. I think in, in the imputation. I'm sorry. Did I? I, I heard. A, I heard an. In, I heard a gap in time. So I'm sorry if I interrupted you. You good. should finish what you were saying, please. No, no. I, yeah. So, so I, I think, I think I did. Um. Yeah. No. So I would say the formal cause, if I'm understanding the categories right, of our justification, is uh, our sharing in the status pronounced over Jesus through our union with Christ. Is what we would say as Protestants. Yeah, I think R.C. Sproul made that clear in one of his books. Um, it was called, and, and I know that uh, R.C. Sproul was another one of the guys I used to follow when I was Reformed. Um, I, I lived close to him too, by ah. St. And- St. Andrews. Yeah, that was his uh, his uh, his uh, church. But um, he he tried to make it clear in his book called Faith Alone yeah. that the formal cause of justification for Protestants is imputation. But I understand that the word imputation. Um, some of the more historically minded Protestants want to yeah. talk about this union share of this share of status because of the union with Christ. Yeah. But I, I think I think that's true. I think that would be the Protestant view of the form, and the, the Catholic view of the form would be um, the righteousness of God infused, which really blots out all of the guilt right. and and plants into us a seed of glory that seed of glory being um the 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 heart the intellect and the will are ordered back to god in submission like what romans 8 says that the mind of the flesh is not subject to god um well the reordered mind is yeah yeah so we would say that's actually part of the formal cause You know. Yeah. So, so I, yeah. So, go, yeah. so, so I hope that's clear. Yeah. Yeah, that's super helpful. So, so as one more conceptual question before we just sort of dive into the text. <laughs> yeah. Um, would be, um, so my understanding is that upon baptism, the both the temporal and eternal debt of punishment is remitted, 
by virtue of the the soul being infused with grace um and and that they're not being post baptismal sin to in any way sort of like defile that yet to break that yet yeah that's um, right and so when one does penance or like does minor sins they might do it imperfectly so so the reason most people i think or at least a lot of people expect purgatory is because throughout the course of life um uh the that your your venial sins have not been necessarily so sometimes they can be but haven't necessarily been completely uh accounted for through works of satisfaction now if that so then my conceptual question there before we just dive into the text would be um would you want to say that after baptism our soul is more more pure and the grounds on which god sort of accepts us are stronger right after baptism than let's say someone right after someone repents receives absolution and does an imperfect uh yeah does imperfect works of penance yeah that's a good good question so these are two so sacra so the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of uh of penance or or uh I, I you know when you read older works they call it different things but um the sacrament of of reconciliation um these are repairing sacraments so um when somebody comes to the font of baptism um there's a repair that takes place right because they're in mortal sin as a result of their placement in adam and so as a, you know through baptism they in other words they, they, their soul is repaired um by this new birth into Adam, the new Adam. Um, well, the same thing uh, similar to that is the sacrament of uh, reconciliation, um, which interestingly enough, in early Christianity, they only saw it happening once or twice. They, In other words, they only gave you one opportunity <laughs> um, to do this. So it, they, it was kind of looked at as like a second plank when this, when you've made a shipwreck of your faith. Um, so mortal sin, uh, like today we, we talk about mortal sin and early Christianity, uh, it was, it was really relegated to like murder, adultery, blasphemy, um, fornication. Um, and there's some other ones, uh, heresy and schism. Okay. Those, those were like capital crimes, you know, and when somebody did that, um, they had one plank left in the ocean, and that was this sacrament of of penance. And it usually took many years. You know, they it, it, they were they'd have to be scheduled. Okay, they yeah. would come. They would speak to the they would speak to the bishop, and and they would say, "Hey, you know, I want to I want to return back to communion with the church," and then the bishop would 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 schedule him a penance, and. Um, there was a series of grades that they would go through. Um, and sometimes bishops shortened it. Sometimes bishops made it longer, depending on the the repentance of the person. But whenever the bishop laid hands on that person to really bring them back so that they could consume the Eucharist, that act was, was looked at as, you know, it's kind of like the same species as baptism sort of bringing them back and restoring them uh, to their status in Christ. Um, so that status is um, would be inferior to baptism because baptism really does blot out all of our iniquities, both temporal and eternal. But uh, the absolution we receive by the hand of the priest or the bishop, um, that takes care of the eternal debt but there is left the um, the remains of temporal guilt, which I think you're correct to point out is both medicinal and um, it, it involves real expiation because, you know, you got a lot of a lot of Catholics today that um, they kind of don't want to stick their neck out um, on this issue of expiation. So they'll try to talk about it as healing only. Um mm -hmm. Let, let's be honest, guys. It, it's 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 both medicinal and uh, there's a definitely a um, satisfaction um, of requirements that that uh, 
God in the forum of heaven, we could say, the, God, the for, forum of, of, of God's court. Um, there's a remain of temporal guilt, which is which is intended to pass away. You know, yeah, um, yeah. So there is that. So it would be inferior to baptism if there's been an accruement of temporal guilt. You know, um, yeah. So, so to ask a quick follow up, then, would, if justification, so are being accepted in the uh, accepted as in the right before God as having the title to eternal life, if that's on the basis of um, infused righteousness, infused uh, the the sort of infused new nature of Christ in, in the soul, does that mean then that, let's say, you know, 50 years later, someone's accrued temporal debt in various ways, but that person's soul 50 years later is in not as good of a place, even if it might be in a good place, um, it's not as in, it, it's not in as good of a place as right, right after they were baptized. Probably. I mean, it, it all depends because, um, you know, we would say that, um, like, for example, the catechumen process in, in the early church um, usually lasted about three years. And what they were looking for in catechumens was, um, number one, were they, uh, were, they give, were they helping people out? Were they helping the poor? Um, secondly, were they helping, um, were they giving alms? Were they giving to the church? Were they giving to their brothers and sisters in Christ? So alms giving and praying and uh charity you know towards the poor towards the the fatherless towards widows um these things were understood to be like the primary character of a christian and those satisfy guilt like the, the proverbs was all uh, um charity covers a multitude of sins um so the way that the early fathers understood this and the way that the scholastics picked this up is that you're always satisfying for whatever remnants of guilt you might have through the ongoing life of charity. So who knows where you're at? Yeah. You know, 10, yeah. 10, 10 years, oh, 10, okay. you know, so, I mean, if, as soon as you come into the church, um, that's it, man. Put on your apron, get a spoon. Let's help people out in the community. Let's uh, let's plan uh, giveaways. Let's uh, let's get a two to uh, needs list. Let's start. You know, so all these things um, we don't we don't keep like a calculation pad with a, like a, yeah. the record of our uh, right. success, right? It's this is all in God's eye. This is right. all in God's eyes. You know, it's not right. really um, it's not something that we can mathematically match up. Yeah. Um, and log in a book somehow. So who knows where they're at 50 years after baptism? So, yeah, so that that's really, yeah. That, so I think that that'll be a sort of another conceptual difference there is that for the Protestant, because Protestants actually historically, particularly in Lutheran and Anglican circles, had actually a doctrine of penance. Yes. Uh, but, oh, yeah. but for us, we would say with repentance, it actually restores you perfectly to sure. your post-baptismal state. Uh, if someone's committed, you know, a life of sin, then repenting actually restores you perfectly. Um, but re genuine repentance, so a, a repentance that involves turning from from sin, hating it, and walking towards God. Um, now, we would want to say then that works of penance, which are were, which in, again in Lutheran and Anglican traditions are there are actually mainly medicinal. And so this is what, yes. like this, so I really appreciate your your thoroughness, Eric, and, and your clarity. Cause like, when I hear that, I'm always left saying, but that's not really the, that's not the issue. <laughs> you know? Yeah. We do agree that, that works of penance are designed to actually target those key areas where sin right. is, is, is damaged us. But we'd want to say that your status is completely stable and completely sealed by faith, uh, which, manifests in repentance exactly you know in fact um when i was a reformed baptist we the church that i attended uh whose name won't be mentioned um we had a doctrine of penance i mean we actually did penance so so if there were people who were excommunicated you know um we you know we followed first corinthians 5 and matthew 18 um where we brought this to the notice of all um, and, and whoever wanted, you know, so whoever was publicly excommunicated, for example, 
um, if they made a petition to return, um, they were usually given one year where they had to be outside the church. They couldn't go to any other church. They had to stay home and um, sort of be counseled by one of the elders, you, you know, in Baptist, you know, Baptist polity. They have the, the, uh, the plurality of elders. Um, and so an elder would come and kind of look at your progress, talk to you, see if you've been praying, see if you've been listening to sermons, if you've been reading the Psalms, um, you know, you're supposed to keep a log of your progress. So all these like really good works that are coming out of this penance process. Now, the London Baptist Confession of Faith doesn't have anything in there about, you know, satisfying post-baptismal guilt that's remaining on the soul. Um, but I would say that that was an intense penitential yep. procedure. Yep. You know, I, I so, completely agree. Yep. So just just to just to clarify for the listeners, which I'm sure you know, a lot of my Catholic brothers are probably not aware, um, and maybe some Protestants would be shocked to hear that a Baptist church is doing that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, um, you're absolutely right, Sean. The mm -hmm. Luther and Calvin did have a probably a much more rigorous understanding of penance than uh, modern day Catholics. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. And a lot of sadly modern day Protestants too. Um, yeah. But yeah, so great. Let's, so let's dive right into the text. And so I sure. think, I think the understandings of baptism are sort of, or of justification are on the table. For the record, both of us, both Eric and I do believe baptism unites you to Christ. Um, that it's just, it decisively is where God justifies and gives adoption, forgiveness of sins. So, so that people know that's, that's not the disagreement either. <laughs> Because certain Baptists will make that the disagreement. And when they do that, they're actually sort of condemning Lutherans along, along with that, and Anglicans, and actually even some Reformed folk. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to get that out on the table. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay, cool. So let's, let's take a look at Romans 4. And Eric, tell me if this is a fair... So here was my, my uh, reading of what you wrote in your book, um, that... Um, as we're dealing with Romans 4 verses, so there are a couple of key things here. Verses 7 through 8 is key because when God reckons righteousness irrespective of works, uh, the psalm that's quoted is cashing that out in terms of the forgiveness of sins and not a positive imputation of the positive status or the positive righteousness of Christ. Would, would that be a fair uh, sort of summary of your argument so far? Yeah. You know, I think that uh, one Protestant uh, author that uh, I had the pleasure of speaking to, oh, this is going back to like 2006 or 2007, Brian Vickers. He was a, he, I think he was an assistant professor over at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. His book on Paul's doctrine of imputation really is one of the best. And he made this point that Romans 7, Romans 4, 7 to 8, um, is just talking about the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, great. So I, I would agree that 4, 7 through 8, it's talking about the, it, it, that that's what that psalm is quoting, definitely. Um, would my, so my impression of the conclusion you draw from that is that uh, therefore, uh, when we're, we're thinking about the negative and positive aspects of justification, so the negative non-imputation of, of sin, i.e. forgiveness, both you and I agree on that. Uh, but then the positive aspect there, you would want to say that the antithesis here is is not, because as we look here, like it, imputation language is used to talk about forgiveness. The antithesis is not uh, the positive imputation of Jesus' status, but rather the renewal of the nature. And you're not getting, of course, the renewal of the nature from here, but you're getting that from other texts. Is that is that fair? Yeah, and I would say that it's fair that uh, that a Protestant could say the same thing. They can get the other, you know, the positive from, other, two, okay. from other texts. Yeah, that's really helpful. That's, so you're not excluding that from this text. It's not. It's not. It's not excluded. No, it's okay. definitely compatible. Yeah, that's really really helpful. Okay, so then in verses four through six, um, I think you wanted to say that when faith is reckoned as righteousness, um, that the uh, the language there is such that faith itself is reckoned as the righteousness of the believer. And of course that gets cashed out through 
a holistic reading of Paul on your view, as I understand it, um, as uh, faith being infused with love, being formed by love, I, which of course is sourced in Christ. It's Christ's virtue being infused in the human heart. Is that is that fair? Yes, as long as we understand that the infusion of that charity uh, is not understood as like a behavioral activity on our part. Um, it's it's literally an infusion of a virtue, which is not a, a human deed. Okay, yeah, great. So then here was, I wrote down my uh, things I wanted to, to bring up here. Um, okay, so as we look at Romans 4, um, when I would want to say that when God looks at, let's say, a door, this is kind of a random example, but like a door, sure. he has an obligation to count that door as a door <laughs> by virtue of its nature. Like, because God is completely truthful, he never lies, and he can never be wrong. He has an obligation to count things according to their nature. Now, there mm -hmm. are things he created, like, it's not like there's something external to himself that's ultimately indebting him to these things, right. but. He has an obligation to count them as what they are. Yes. Um, now, similarly, I would want to say that, so to use sort of the, a different category of obligation or merit, um, if someone works, let's say, you know, you hire me to, to mow your lawn or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And you say, I will give you $50 an hour. Now, that's pretty exorbitant. Like, that's a lot, you know, for an hour of work, or right? $50, $50. But when... When, um, how would you understand? So, like, before we're, and you probably know where the trajectory of thought is going, mm -hmm. but in, in Romans 4 4, now to the one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something owed. So, a fail, failma is, is sort of used there. Um, how do you understand that analogy that Paul's using of paying a wage, um, for work with respect to treating justification as something that's merited? By yeah. Faith. yeah, that's a very good, very, very good question. So the first thing I'd like to say, um, and this is going to be more si a systematic idea before I answer the question, um, and that is that in Paul, okay, um, I don't think anything that the Christian does um, in love towards God. So like, let's talk about martyrdom just as the most blatant mm -hmm. example, okay? Um, if a, if if so let's take Saint Peter who was crucified upside down in Rome, or Saint Paul who was beheaded in Rome, okay, I don't think that Paul's theology is such that anything any activity done by the Christian can really be summed up as a work that he excludes from justification. So, for example. Um, Romans 4, 1 here says, what, uh, it says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our father has found according mm -hmm. to the flesh? I think that's very important because in Paul, everything that the Christian does is not according to the flesh. And here I take the meaning of sarks. I don't take this to mean like the the negative connotation of being fallen in in Adam. I think what he means here is just what did Abraham find according to his human nature, which mm. is good, you know. Um, I don't think Paul sees anything of the new covenant salvation, whether it's faith or works. Okay, so martyrdom. I don't think he would say that that's a work done by the flesh. OK, so because even that in Paul's theology, even martyrdom is still energized by the grace of Christ. And so there's really no thanking the human hand. Right. Even even and we get this in Corinthians, like they're talking about, you know, well, I like Apollos and I like Paul and I like Peter. And and Paul says, look, not even your faith is something that you're the author of. Mm -hmm. uh, right in 1 Corinthians 4, he says, uh, uh, why do you boast as if you had not received it? If you've received it, then you have no place to boast, right? So what Paul's trying to do here is he's trying to ex exclude human boasting, 
okay? The ability for the human to say, according to my own powerful capacity, I have I was able to achieve a certain thing. Now, there's there's a lot of things that a human can do. A human can be circumcised. I mean, how many people get a flint knife and and do this? It's 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 common, okay? Uh, circumcision with hands would be a, a human deed done in the flesh, okay? But I don't think that Paul would say a martyrdom done by the power of the Holy Spirit is 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 like that. Do you see? Yeah, I, I think. Yeah. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? So what 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 I the way Paul opens up Romans four is he's saying what did Abraham find according to the flesh? Okay, that's when he gets into this question of works and wages. Okay, so what Paul means by works that earn wages, I I take it to mean that um, if a human being does something where it natively demands a, a repayment for what it's done on its own grounds, okay? Then it's kind of like the, 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 the story that Jesus gave about the workers, the, the, those who came early, those who came late, and they were all given the same wage, right? Those who demanded more for their time, if they were there early, the, because, because natively they did more, you see? Sure. Um, so I think Paul is saying here that, uh, anybody who works for their justification, meaning from the ground up, they do it. That would be a justification by works in, hmm. in this, in this sense. Okay. A justification by grace would be anything that departs from that. And, and, and we see this in Romans 2, uh, verse 28, or I'm sorry, Romans 2, verse 25 to 29, um, Paul is contrasting the man who is circumcised but doesn't keep the law, or he doesn't fulfill, I think he says, the, 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 the righteous decree of the law, or the righteous mm -hmm. precepts of the law. Um, but then there's the man who doesn't have circumcision, but he maintains the law, okay? Then he says, that's the true Jew, okay? But then you would say, well, he's talking about a guy who keeps the law, so that's got to be works, right? But then he says, the, the, the true Jew is not, who, is not the one who is outwardly, but the one who is inwardly. So for Paul... This distinction between outward and inward is the distinction between works and gift. Okay. So, and okay, so, yeah. yeah. So, uh, if you want to stop me, go ahead. If you well, need to be, so, clarify something. Yeah. 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 So, so if I'm understanding you right, you'd want to say that for one. So, what was gained by Abraham, our, our father, according to the flesh? That's talking about works done. Uh, sort of from from the the bottom up, so works done that are sort of like trying to get at your own justification, with, apart from the grace of God. Is with that, the, is that with the power? Yeah, with the power of Adam, you know, with the power of uh, nature, basically the power of yeah. nature. Yeah. So my my problem with that is sort of twofold within Romans four. Yeah. Um, so well, first of all, what I appreciate though about what you're your interpretation of saying is, is it doesn't seem like you're saying that like it's talking only about Jewish ceremonial works. It seems no. like you're saying in Romans four, let's talk about any work that's done to earn your justification. And so this is actually really for any Protestants that are listening. Um, I think Roman Catholicism clearly denies Pelagianism. <laughs> like that's yeah. a charge that's often lobbied. And I just don't think that's fair. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, that I think that's true. But my problem with that from this text is, uh, so in sort of twofold, like so first in verse three, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, this is a key text in a lot of ways because Paul is quoting Genesis 15. But Abraham obeys the promise of Genesis 12 and Hebrews 11 picks up on what Abraham does in Genesis 12. And yeah. so it seems that when Paul is, is locating that in Abraham's life, it's it's he's already become an Israelite. He's already become a covenant member. 
And so Genesis 15 is sort of sustaining that in a point where he's already sort of in, in the bounds of the covenant. Mm -hmm. And then I think my second problem there um, is that when we see like faith reckoned as righteousness, that antithesis between uh, to the one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due, but to the one without works, trusts him who justifies the ungodly faith is reckoned as righteousness. So it seems like the parallels there are like, uh, work being reckoned not as a gift, but as a due. So work being reckoned as a due and faith being reckoned as righteousness. So the antithesis is that uh, works are sort of, uh, they're reckoned according to what is owed to works, right? So, or, or wages rather. Wages are reckoned according to what is owed. It doesn't seem, if that if that if if I'm reading that parallel right, it seems like Paul's saying that God doesn't owe it intrinsically to faith, even faith that he gives, right? So God owes it to his own works to to credit them as, as his own works. He, he owes it to himself to regard, you know, like when he creates an act of holiness in someone's heart, he owes it to himself to regard that as a righteous act because it proceeds from him. It seems like he... Uh, Paul is saying that God doesn't owe it to faith to reckon it as at least the kind of righteousness he's talking about in this passage. Yeah, so, that's, yeah, a, that's a very good. Yeah, that's a very good. Very. This is the classic, <laughs> the locus classicus of the um, of the reformed um, objection, you know, to to the doctrine of Catholic justification. So here's what I would say: You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Genesis fifteen six. Um, is not talking about like Abraham's initial translation from Adam to Christ, pro, you know, proleptically, you know, meaning he received retrospectively the the gift of Christ. Um, so Genesis twelve three would be where you know as soon as he believed in in God, as soon as he believed in the Word and moved out of Ur of the Chaldees. Um, that was his translation, his initial justification. So Catholics who traditionally would like to say, oh, well, we're going to handle this workless justification in Romans 4 um, by saying that it's just Abraham's initial justification. But after that, we can swarm in all the good works and penitence. You know, no, that's 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 not that's not an option in uh, Romans 4. Um, the second thing. So. So, yes, this is this is. Uh, this is after this. This would be an event in the midst of Abraham's conversion life, um, his journey to God. OK, um, the, then the second thing I'd like to say is that um, you're absolutely right to put your finger on this issue of gift versus do, because if if faith itself has all the value that deserves the recognition of righteousness, then we're talking about a one-to-one -one decision. It's not a gratuitous decision. Mm -hmm. You know, if faith, if faith um, has everything that um, that would require that recognition from God, who cannot lie, um, then it's the ledger is equal. You know, faith on one side, God's recognition on the other side. That's that's a that's an equilibrium. That's that's not a gift. A gift would be where one side is sort of like empty or um, is is taking in the gift of another side. So um, the 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 concept of inequality has to be maintained in order for gift to be maintained in a, in a sense. Um, but here's my here's here's what I would say. Okay, it's it, it's possible. It's possible to say that faith then becomes emptied and is just in this context of justification an instrument to receive the the alien grace that's not native to faith. Okay, that's a possibility. So, so Luther's interpretation of Romans four, Calvin's interpretation of Romans four, that's definitely a candidate sure. so far. Okay, here's why I'm not persuaded to go that route, and then I'll explain what alternative route I go. Okay, so if you keep reading in Romans 4, and I know you know this, but just for the listeners, um, in Romans 4, verse uh, 
17, uh, we read Paul writing, um, or we'll start at 16, actually. Well, no, we can start at 17 or 16, 16 D, if you can follow my letters, yeah. uh, of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed. God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed so that's the first thing so in hope he believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken so shall your descendants be and here and here's where um i'd like you know the eyes to kind of lock in and not being weak in faith he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And this is, this is where I'm going. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, so what's exegetically clear, okay, is that whatever Paul just described about Abraham serves as some kind of a cause to his being, to his faith being reckoned as righteousness. Yes. Now, there's two ways to interpret this. The reformed way would be, well, yes, faith kind of just puts you in the audience to let God act on stage. You know, in other words, faith is sort of the human saying, I can't do anything, no nothing in my hands I bring. Um, I'm going to sit down in the audience and the curtains are going to open up and I'm going to let God do his thing, you know. And, 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 and so that some like so that brings God glory that way. You know, or it, it kind of brings it pleases God that way because it makes God the clear actor and the clear performer, you know, but it, that is a possible take, but I don't take it. And here's why. Because unbelief in Paul's writings is a sin. It is a sin, you know, so Abraham could have walked away you know so when god came to him at ur of the chaldees and for the for that matter i think paul here is not describing simply genesis 15 6 i think he's referring to the whole life of abraham here sure. you know sure. yeah. so this applies to genesis 12 3 yeah. applies to genesis 20, 15 6 22 all yeah. the way to his burial all right yeah. um so at any time you know abraham could have gone um in harmony with um in in harmony with human temptation which would have been i'm old i'm you know my wife's old uh you know this is just i just don't have a handle on this what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna go into hagar right and that would be, that's what in, in Galatians 4, Paul contrasts the path of works and the path of grace with those two mountains, Hagar and Sarah, right? So Abraham at any time could have, and he did, okay? He did tempt, he, he did, uh, uh, what, what do you call, he, t he did dabble in the attempt to, to get the promise through his works when he took Hagar, right? Um, so, but his perseverance, when he was finally told, no, 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 it's from Sarah, not Hagar. It's from Sarah. <laughs> from Sarah, the promised child will come. That he had, he could have, you know, he could have had his doubts again. He could have grown weak in faith, but he grew strong. 
Okay. Now, d- does this mean Abraham is working his way through penance and and he's saying his hail marys and he's you know he's 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 subtracting his temporal guilt and no 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 I'm not let let's not get carried away. Um, but I prefer the interpretation that this is actually talking about the obedience of Abraham. Okay, it's something that you know the the choice to to believe or on or not to believe um in scripture it it is a matter of obedience or disobedience you know so when you believe in jesus paul thinks that that's obedience like he says in romans 6 he says you were once free in regard to righteousness you know when you were in the flesh you were free in regard to righteousness but you obeyed from the heart that doctrine to which you were delivered or like Romans 1, 5, Romans 16, where it talks about the Gentiles being brought into the obedience of faith. Or, yeah. or when Christ says, go out and preach the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will face condemnation. So, so believing itself, okay, even though it's energized by the electing grace of God, it's still an act of obedience. So, okay. so let me see if I understand yeah, can be right. Um, so you see two, because I think you're right about that fundamental question that drives like going to one of these two uh, positions. Because there has to be something, because God's not arbitrary, there has yes. to be something about faith that, that, oh, that makes it fit or meet, <laughs> fit and right for God to give us eternal life on on that bit, on that basis for him to credit it as righteousness there has to be something in there um and you know you see an interpretation in the protestant side which would say um you know it's it's you know like the so, sort of like uh i bring nothing like god brings everything and that sort of brings glory to him um and then on the roman catholic side um it would at least be sort of like faith as as sort of the um as the principle of obedience through Abraham's life, that aspect of it, of faith, of spirit empowered obedience, not sort of obedience from trying to like get justification from your own efforts, but of spirit produced obedience, which characterizes faith. That would be the the characteristic. Am I, am I interpreting you right? Yes. And, and, and it, it could go for a workless event too. So like, for example, in, in Genesis 15, six, I don't think Abraham's actually doing a work at that moment. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't yeah. call it spirit empowered obedience there because okay. because at that moment all Abraham's doing is he's hearing the promise and he's believing it. Yeah. Um, which is an act of obedience in a sense, but it's not it's not typically what we would call like the good work that God will judge on the last day. I mean it it technically is, but it's not um like an outward good work like sacrificing Isaac or being willing to sacrifice Isaac. So there's still something to contrast between 15 15 6 in Genesis and Genesis 22, where he actually takes Abraham and you know. Yeah, so that's really helpful. So I, I wanted to then like so hone in on that because this was the one place I'd want to just nuance. Um because you also I think in the book you also mentioned that like the Protestant view is sort of this view of like rece- reception, like I bring nothing. And and it is, but th- there, in, in sort of the Reformed confessions, there is a reason given. Now it's not, I don't think it's in Romans 4, it's when, when you sort of read Romans 4 with Romans, like Romans 4 through 6, and then when you read Galatians. But I want us to read a couple of these things from some of the Reformed sources. Sure. Um, so, so this is Calvin. Um and he says, moreover, lest by his cavails, uh, he deceived the unwary. I acknowledge that we are devoid of this incomparable gift. He's talking about justification, actually, uh, until Christ becomes ours. Therefore, to that union of headed members, the residence of Christ in our hearts, in fine, the mystical union, we assign the highest rank. Christ, when he becomes ours, making us partners with him in the gifts which, with which he was endued, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So he talks about, like, uh, we the reason that God can can count us righteous by faith is because of the union. And so what I'd want to suggest, and I think you can also find this in his commentary on first Corinthians and find that in it. And this is, um, this is an especially key uh, phrase from uh, Malang. I think, no, this is, 
Luther in his treatise on Christian liberty. Faith unites the soul with Christ. Uh, and so the, the key, and you have this in Melanchthon and you have this, especially in Edwards, it's very clear in, in Edwards' work and even in Burton, that faith is itself the act of unition. So when, when the reason it, it renders it meet and right in us for God to credit it as righteousness is because it unites us to Christ. So a lot of the Protestant reformers understood faith itself, and yes, the faith fruitful through love, but faith itself as the, the means by which we are united to Christ. So justification by faith alone is really a shorthand, <laughs> and it's shorthand for a sentence that's much longer, uh, that the soul, the soul grounds of our justification, so that word soul is not applied to the word faith, but actually applied, it's an adverb, uh, the sole grounds of our justification is faith, which unites us to Christ, through which we participate in his in his uh, status. So I, I would want to make that that nuance in that where we would take issue is we would want to say it's not that faith was the principle of obedience that made it fit and right for God to count it as righteous, though we agree that it does. It is a principle, the principle of obedience. But we'd want to say also, uh, well, we'd want to say essentially uh, that what makes it fit and right is that faith is it is itself the Holy spirit on the human heart and grafting that person into Christ. Yeah. And so so I, I, trust is what it feels like for the Holy spirit to do that. Yes. Yes. So what I would say is that, uh, you know, Romans four, uh, 20 or 18 to 22 um, really is what drives my alternative reading to this. You know, uh, I, I think that Paul is looking at um, the faith in Abraham, right? He's describing it with certain merits even. I mean, I hate to use that word because sure. um, even though I do cite some fathers, you know, like some of the more, uh, some of the fathers of the, of the church that have been, um sort of used, you know, by uh, some of the Lutheran patristic scholars, like some of the, you know, the Augsburg. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And you know, Chemnitz. Yes. Uh, um, I have, I have, I have some books. I have uh, Gerhard's book here somewhere. Um, and, uh, but some of them will quote, you know, Chrysostom, Ambrose, Augustine, mm -hmm. Hillary of Poitiers, where they say faith alone, because they do. They, they say faith alone, and almost, and, and many times, it almost sounds like they're just talking about the remission of sin. So it kind of plays into the forensic law court um, sort of uh, clemency. But I, I cite a lot of fathers on Genesis 15, 6, and their commentary on Genesis 15, 6 seems to to almost in every single instance um, follow what Paul says here in Romans 4.22, where in therefore, mm -hmm. I don't have my Greek New Testament with me, so I'm Who trying to, yeah. yeah, and I, because sometimes, you know, the English will have therefore, but that right. in the Greek, it's not there. Um, but in this case, I think it, that is. word is definitely there in the Greek. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Um, like I said, the Protestant reading of allowing faith to be simply like that act of unition where it's like, okay, I'm going to join to Christ through faith, but all the good stuff on him is what grounds my righteousness. You see, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, I would say that, you know, that's a possible reading. It's not alien to the logic because it's still in keeping with the principle of grace, right? So, I mean, if if we said that all the good stuff is in Christ and it's it's imputed to me through the act of union with Christ, that's uh, Paul would have listened to that. Even as a Catholic, I can say this. I think Paul would have listened to that and says, "Yeah, I'm in." You know, um, but I also think that what Paul really is saying here is that there's something about faith itself. Not faith itself, as in like the ascent of the intellect, yeah. but but faith joined with love, which disposes the heart to go with God's plan rather than Abraham's own plan 
right? And then, and, and here's the thing, okay? I tried to make this clear in my book. This is very important here, what I'm about to say. Is, is that when God when God credited Abraham's faith as righteousness, he's also giving something to Abraham that's not in Abraham. So this mm -hmm. is where I this is where I want to bring in the clear gratuity or the gratuitousness of my interpretation of this text is that when Romans in Romans 3, 25 and 26, Paul talks about how God passed over sins that were previously committed. Um, out of forbearance. Um, but now, through the cross, the righteousness of God, meaning, you know, th his own rectification for forgiving sinners is revealed, right? Um, so God's also giving Abraham the status of the forgiveness of sins, even, even through the midst of his conversion and journey with God. So whenever Abraham makes an act of faith, whether that's at the beginning of his conversion or at the end of his conversion, God can isolate that act, that faith itself, and consider it righteousness because he's also giving to him the status of the forgiveness of sins, which is not bought by the cost of faith, but by the cost of the blood of Jesus. So, so let me let me address that therefore passage. Yeah. So, I think you and I would agree that any any theory of justification should be able to account ideally for all of the scriptural data. Yeah. The more it can account for, the better it is. Um, the Protestant reading of twenty two through twenty four five would would be to say that what Paul's talking about in sixteen through twenty five is the kind of faith that justifies. So, therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteous as. Because, so that, that being sort of the conclusion of showing before the kind of faith that justifies is a faith that's a principle of obedience uh, and love. Um, no other faith justifies than that. Now, I would want to say that that reading, which is sort of a standard of like you know, fruit root kind of metaphor. Yeah, that seems to account for the prior verses, verses uh, four through five, in which God's God is said uh, to not count faith according to what is due to it because i would still argue it seems like on your model there where the reason god can credit faith as righteousness is because in 16 through 25 um, it contains the principle of obedience even if given by god given by grace uh, that doesn't seem to fit well with that claim that god is not reckoning to faith what is due to it because if you know if the principle of obedience is god's work even so he'd be obligated to reckon it as righteousness in the same way he's obligated to reckon the door as a door uh, because it just is what he's doing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so this is you know this is something i had to wrestle with and I, I have a whole chapter devoted to romans 4 uh in the book so i had to wrestle with this and some of the principles some of the key principles that led me to come to the decision i came to was that uh, like what i said in the beginning namely that for Paul, um, even sanctification, even the progressive sanctification of a believer, for example, um, that is that's not th that is also not something that we can boast about. So, so, so this is what I'm trying to say. If it were the case that, and let's let's put on a Protestant lens, our uh, a, a Protestant eyeglasses on. Um, we could all agree justification is free, totally gratuitous by the righteousness of Christ imputed to us through our union with Christ. Um, nothing in our hands we bring, simply to thy cross we cling, right? Um, but the sanctification that is inseparably united to justification um, involves my works. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I'm not going to boast about the gift of justification. Right. God can have that one. Yeah. But, but um, I'm going to kind of put my thumbs under my overall straps um, and, and, and boast in my sanctification because sure. that involves my good. I don't think Paul, I don't think Paul's theology 
has that allowance. So um, that's number one. So I don't think that my interpretation of Abraham's faith being, in some sense, what is being credited as righteousness would have to revert back to what Paul says in Romans 4.1, where if he did get justified by works, he would have reason to boast. Because if we're going to say that, then then all of sanctification has to be a reason to boast. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So I would agree that we can't boast about sanctification. Absolutely. Um. And I also actually do agree that I think the Catholic view is squarely out of a lot of people accuse it of, of like pride or whatever. Like, I don't think that's a fair charge. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I do think like when we hone in on that particular metaphor. So, yeah. So does the Catholic view exclude boasting? Yes. But is it the only thing that would like it much? I would say if the Catholic view excludes boasting, which it does, because both of us would agree it does with respect to sanctification then much more so would it exclude boasting if justification wasn't isn't something God's obligated to credit to us. And I think Paul's sort of taking that stronger line in verses uh, four through five, that it's absolutely, like there, there couldn't even be the, the sort of slight possibility, like it's utterly absurd because, uh, because of what, what Paul's, or what God's doing. He's crediting it as something that he doesn't owe to it. Uh, yeah, that. well, I can't argue with that. I mean, that's just logical. You know, if right. if it was the case that uh, justifying righteousness was completely extra nos, you know, completely <laughs> alien to us, um, it would be a stronger argument for the exclusion of human boasting and human works. There's no, I can't argue with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, but what I would say is that um, it's it's just a little bit too hard for me to it, it doesn't move the needle for me because it's hard for me to read what Paul says there about Abraham's faith and you know so when he describes it um, yes we can go with the interpretation where it's like well it's just describing the kind of faith that Abraham had. So that's that's just illustrative of the kind of faith that unites the person to Jesus whose then alien righteousness is what mm -hmm. gets credited to him. That's possible. It's not incoherent, okay? But what I think it lacks is probability. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because it it I have to it, when I read Romans 4:18 to 22 I feel myself in my own conscience, I feel like I would have to foist this idea. Well, well, Paul's laboring to define Abraham's faith in this way, not because those things are why God credited to Abraham as righteousness, but because that's just illustrative of a certain kind of faith, which then is another instr instrument for another source of righteousness. Do you see what I'm saying? It's almost like I need to insert two sources, whereas Paul just simply says, look, this is what Abraham did, okay? He didn't go with his temptations. Um, he didn't go with his rationality, human rationality. He went with God's plan over his plan. And God decided to count that as righteousness because he's using the blood of, cro of the cross to cover all of his sins. So, I and, think and, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I, so I think that is more, I think I'm parking closer to the text. Forgive me for saying so. I, no, I think no, I'm no, parking no, closer okay. to the text. Um, but I do think that the parking space next to it, which requires that of that, like, because you're taking the logic of Romans 4 verses four to seven mm -hmm. and trying to you're, you're trying to say that that puts it closer to paul i would just say i disagree on that point i think that it's the other way so that that would be the difference there yeah so i, I think i'd want to push back on the probability claim namely because of actually verse 20 um so no distrust made abraham waver concerning the promise of god but he grew strong at, uh, in his faith as he gave glory to God. And then verse 21 is, is this participle that I think is describing what it means 
like sort of a descriptive participle, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. So it seems like in verse 20 through 21, that's sort of framing uh, Paul's discussion of Abraham sort of walking in these footsteps of faith in terms of trust, in terms of the interior, in that disposition of there's no distrust that makes him waver. And he gives glory by being or being fully convinced that God was able to do what he was promised. So that that seems there, right? Yeah. So what do you think about that? That seems I'm seeing that as actually internal to the logic of uh, verses 20 through 25. Yeah, yeah. Good point. So um, so what I would say is here, I think we're going to have to back up and say, what is trust? Because. Uh, this is where I think some of the Lutheran writers in the Book of Concord, you know, and some of the Catholics at the time differed. Okay. Yeah. Because for a Catholic, um, it, it almost sounded like what Lutherans were saying sounded like faith formed by love. Because, yeah. but in the Book of Concord and in, in the Institutes of Christian Religion and in the Confessions, uh, the Westminster, um, it, the faith that is desirous of God, you know, faith that goes along with God, that's, you know, so, like the Baptists sometimes call it repentant faith. Um, that is precisely what a Catholic means when we say faith that is formed by charity we are talking about we're not talking about a faith that is also bringing with it my my you know participation at the soup kitchen or faith plus my participation um going out and sharing the gospel or adding all these lurk loving works to my faith when we say faith hope and i know you know this but i'm just saying this for the sake of the listeners yeah. faith formed by charity is simply the will uniting to god in repentance and obedience. So it's not even something that necessarily requires an outward action. Um, it's something that's in the heart. So Abraham's trusting in God. Um, you know, um, he's not going to go with his temptations to, to believe in what he can procure through Hagar. Okay. He's going to go ahead and walk in faith with God's plan. That is charity. That is that is Abraham taking on God over the alternatives. And so that's not just faith alone. It's also charity. But see, the Lutheran or the Reformed will look at that and they say, no, no, no. We can say that that's just faith alone. So well, I think that's where that would be a point of, of uh, you know, something to look at. Well, yeah. So I, I want to push back there sort of on two fronts, because with the Reformed and, and Lutheran, I would say, view of of um, sola fide that alone cause really modifies the word justify right it, it's not it's not really designed to sort of say because like yeah they, they're in the in westminster for example there's that line that faith alone justifies but the faith that justifies is never alone yes um and so i wanted to read this this uh quote by turretin uh because i think this this states it really well um the question is not whether solitary faith, i.e. separated from the other virtues, justifies, which we grant could not easily be the case. This is not even true living, living, true and living faith. But whether it alone concurs to the act of justification, the question is not whether the faith which justifies, qua justification, qua justification right. works by love, for otherwise it would not be living but dead. Rather, the question is with whether faith by which it justifies or in the act itself of justification is considered under such a relation. So like what, what that means is that, you know, we, we wouldn't even necessarily disagree with the formula faith working through love, but the, the reason that doesn't really get at the fundamental issue is because we're still like, we can concede. Yeah. It's, it's a faith that works by love. That's the only kind of faith that justifies you. But then we would want to say, but the grounds going back to that fundamental question of God's acceptance of you is not the virtuousness sort of inherent in that act of faith. We could even grant that it is a virtue. And I think it is faith formed by love definitely is a virtue. Um, it's, it's a habitus created in the human heart. Absolutely. Right. But we would want to say, but it's not the righteousness of that habitus, that virtuousness of, of that habit 
that uh, that is sufficient for justification before a holy God. It is the the status of Jesus shared by the believer, and and I think that you know as we sort of move through, uh, man, it's so I only have like ten minutes left, which is a bummer. That's okay. I, I really <laughs> would love to do this do this again if you're open to it. But yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, as we sort of move through the text. Um, you, and I, I think you addressed this in another podcast, but I'm forgetting your answer. So in Romans 6, uh, following on the heels of Romans 5, um, where, you know, how can we go on uh, sinning that grace may abound? If Paul is understanding justification or, or the righteousness that, that, it, that renders justification to the believer, if he's understanding that in terms of the virtue, then why would that question come up? So like, uh, what what then are we to say? Shall we continue in sin in order that grace may abound by no means? Um, yeah, so remind me, you did, I remember you answering that question, but remind me what your answer was. Yeah, yeah. So let me first say that, you know, the whole faith working through love thing. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think if we go back to Galatians, you know, the way that Paul reasons, he says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, mm -hmm. right? And then he says, what does avail? What does avail is faith working through love. Sure. And so I think it's important in the context of Paul's doctrine of justification that faith working through love, like all of that, is avails with God. Um, sure. And so the, and the, so the whole thing, it, it, so it's not like, you know, it's not like Paul went to, like the Judaizers went to Galatia and said, you know, oh, well, these people are, you know, they're living in sin. They need to, they need to start obeying God, you know. Sure. Um, no, the, what they lacked was like the outward ceremonial, you know, Jewish circle, you know, the boundary markers. Now, that does not mean that works of the law and Paul's doctrine of justification is reduced the way that the new perspectives um, try to do right. it. But what, what it does mean is that for Paul, faith working through love, um, that's also not a reason to boast. You know, that, that, that also, that's, it, it would be terribly inconsistent for Paul to say, well, you can boast in circumcision, but you could also bo boast in faith working through love right. if you don't isolate the faith as the sole, um, as the instrumental you know, get rid of the love part for a second. Let's just focus on the faith part. Um, I think that for Paul, he just doesn't work that way. You know, sure. so like, in, so in Romans 6, I'll go to Romans 6 to answer the question because I know we're, we're limited on time. So I would say that Paul is talking about the Mosaic law and he's looking, he's being, he's, he's probably recollecting as he's writing, as he's citing this probably, you know, for the, 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 the um, I forgot the name of the man who wrote the script of Romans, but as he was speaking to him, he's probably thinking, okay, when I talk about the law of Moses to my Jewish brethren um, and I tell them that the law came in after Abraham, right? And then uh, it increased sin. It sort of increased the transgression of Adam um, in order that grace might come in and swoop and take over. Right. Um, so when Christ comes, um, that's a redemptive historical formula where God, it's almost like, I, I, forgive me for sounding crass, but it almost sounds like what Paul's saying is that um, God brought an increase to guilt and transgressions in order that his own purpose of a grace might get, be given in return. Right. So in other words, God himself was behind the increase of sin just so that he can come around in the end and not bring judgment, but bring salvation. So if, in other words, that that redemptive historical function of the law. So basically, Paul, if you're giving that role to the law and you're saying that God brought an increase of sin, just so that he can match it or or uh, can, um, sort of uh, take it over by his grace. Well, 
if 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 that was going on for the whole time for the law of Moses, why don't we just continue doing it? You know, um, so I and I don't necessarily think that the righteous there righteousness there needs to be like the completely extra nos. Everything's taken care of. You know, you're united to Christ. Everything He did gets everything done for you. Therefore, why do we have to do anything? I don't think that that's what he's doing. I think that the, the immediate context is the law came in so that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded so that as so that as sin reigned in death, then right after that, so the Mosaic period, so the, the period of Adam to Moses and then Moses to Jesus, sin reigned. But now that the grace of God has come, like Titus 2 says, the grace of God has appeared, um, now grace might reign through righteousness. So he's he's thinking historical. He's talking about an era or an epochal. He's, he's got the logic he's working with is is uh, dispensational, historical. Um, so if, if that's what the law was doing and that's what all this stuff was for for all these years, Paul, why don't we just continue it? And then so, Paul answers that yeah, and says, yeah. but you're not understanding the gift. The gift itself is transformative. Yeah, so I, I agree. Yeah, okay, so you're saying, if I'm understanding your argument, you're saying that objection comes up because in 520, Paul just said the law came in with the result that trespasses multiplied. Uh, and so where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And so it sounds like from Romans 5, you're saying that God gave the law in order to increase sin. Is, even though, obviously, Paul doesn't, he he is going to refute that. Uh, yes. Or yeah. complicate that. So I guess my problem with that reading is I think that reads, because Paul does say, bring that objection. In, and actually, he comes close to saying it in Romans 7, that God gives the law as a way of increasing sin, but then he makes it clear that it's not because the law is bad, but because it draws out our sinfulness. But it seems like that reading is sort of importing, I'd say, Romans 7 into Romans 6, where Romans 6 is immediately answering uh, 5, 18 through 21, which where which doesn't sort of give God's in, uh, a statement of God's intentions at all. Um, so the law came in with the result that trespasses multiply. Yeah, so that doesn't I, I, necessarily, I, I don't, yeah. yeah. I, so I think so I, I think that um, I think I'm not I'm not contesting that at all. So what I'm saying here is that in the in the in the historical era from Adam to Moses and under the covenant of the law, so Mos the Mosaic covenant, okay. So that so when 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 he says moreover the law entered, he's talking about a historical moment. Okay, so when he says, moreover, the law entered, he doesn't mean there when it entered into my consciousness. Right. Yes. He's talking about when the when the law was actually given on Mount yeah. Sinai. Right. Yes. Okay. So this. So moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. So in other words, the the offense and actually, in, I, I wish I had my Greek New Testament, That's but really this helpful. I think I, I think that this is talking about the offense of Adam. So okay. in other words, yeah. more, so in other words, the historical event of Mount Sinai, the the purpose of that, in this sense, was to make Adam's transgression abound. So that that would not have happened in Egypt or with Joseph and Jacob and Isaac. Okay, this is talking about a historical time uh, where 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 God came through the Sinaitic legislation. And as a result of that, sins were turned into transgressions, just like in the Garden of Eden. Um, and then, but where sin abounded, meaning where Israel, Israel's history, that's all that it, that's all that we got from the law was, yeah. you know, Israel's failure one after the next, the period of the judges, the chronicles, the kings, um, sin abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace. Now, grace is also a historical moment mm -hmm. because in Romans 6, 14, he says, you're not under the law, but under yes. grace. Grace is an epoch. 
I, right. I, I definitely think that Douglas J. Mood did a very good job here. George Eldon Ladd, I, I completely agree that with their interpretation of Paul, that grace is epochal. It's yeah. it, it, But it also has connotations for everywhere in history. So even Abraham had grace, right? Genesis 15, 6. Um, but sometimes he has a slant to his word, grace and law. Yeah. So sometimes law is talking about, you know, just uh, trans historical, but sometimes he's talking about historically specific. And so I think that what Paul Paul's giving a, a, a redemptive historical logic to the Sinai code. And then he's saying, yeah, the, the, he, he gave the code at Sinai so that transgressions might abound, just so that when Christ would come in the future with the new covenant, grace might take it over. Okay. Well, the Jews going to hear that and say, well, if that's the case, then why don't we just continue the historical process? And, you know, because if God's going to do it one time, he'll do it a second time. You know, yeah, that's actually so. So as I'm looking at the Greek here, I, I actually do think that that's that's reasonable. Uh, so in verse 20, like because a Hina, it uses a Hina clause, which, as you probably know, would like, be taken either as purposive or like consequential. Um, yeah. So okay, uh, forgive me. I'm just trying to get my Novus Testamento. I just I don't know if it's here. If it's I, I, I'm sorry, I should have brought it with me. I You're apologize. totally good. You're totally good. Um, so, OK, so then uh, let I think that would be a good point maybe to return to at some point as sort of the, the last question I sort of want to ask just methodologically is um, would it complicate your view or pose, pose a challenge for it if the semantic domain of justification was routinely judicial uh, and wasn't, even if it's like done on the basis of someone having lived morally, you know, um, but that that word is focused on sort of God, uh, a judicial proclamation of being in the right. So, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I, I don't exactly know if I'm going to be at odds with the majority of Catholic theologians today. I think I'm not. But I, I, do, I just want the audience to be clear. I'm not speaking on behalf of the Catholic Church here when I say this. I'm, 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 I'm giving my opinion, my private interpretation. Um, I do think that that's the primary um, definition. Of justification, so like Romans 8, 33, 34, right. where well, who can bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Well, justification is clearly the dropping of all the charges. Okay. Yes. So that's that's that to me that's but, exegetically clear. It's semantically clear. Um, yeah, that, that, that's what well, that is. I, and I want to I want to say would it would it complicate your view if it, it was even further than like not just like dropping all the charges though it involves that, but like a positive, because the, the particular text I'm thinking of, and I would love to get your thoughts on this before needing to, to head out, um, but um, would be sort of Luke 7, the tax collectors, you know, Jesus pronounces forgiveness for the tax collectors and the tax collectors justify God, you know, because Jesus refutes the Pharisees. That use of the word justify, it can't be, it can't be forgiveness um, because there's nothing to forgive God for. And it can't be to make God righteous either. Um, so it, ha it has to be declaring him to be in the right. Now, I would agree that when God does that for human sinners, that, that clearly presupposes him dropping the charges and giving forgiveness. Like that wouldn't make sense for the charges to stick and for God to declare someone in the right. But yeah. it does, it does seem like the, the sort of emphasis of that is this positive declaration of being on the right side of the covenant. So yeah, what, what are your thoughts to that before I... Before yeah, I, I know. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll be respectful for your time, and 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 maybe we could do this again. Um, I, I would love to. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, um, so you know, and again, my I I need to have my New Testament in front of me, but First Corinthians chapter five. You know, um, do you not know that the adikia or the adikion? I think mm -hmm. the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom right. of God. So you've got the 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 the, the alpha negative mm -hmm. to the dikaios word group, you know the adikion, yeah. the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then he lists a whole bunch of sins of what the Corinthians used to be. Then he says, "But you were washed, you were sanctified, mm -hmm. you were justified, justified." Yeah. Okay. 
So if you take the the negate, the alpha negative to dikaios, um, you know, the odd dikaios will not inherit the kingdom of God, right? So fornicators, adulterers, thieves, all these things. Then at the end, you've been washed, sanctified, and justified. I don't take washing, sanctification, and the justification to be the same exact metaphor. They're not, okay? Mm -hmm. But... The context there is talking about the transition of their life. Sure. And so so justification still is talking about the drought. You know, it's it's judicial. Yes. Obviously, the charges are dropped and you are being recognized as a friend of God. Sure. Because because your 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 soul has been reordered back to be submissive to God. The the mind of the flesh or the the I think that's how Paul says it. The 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 law the the mind of I can't remember it's Romans eight but the mind is not subject to the law of God yeah. nor when you're in the flesh the mind is not subject to the law of God you're Possible not a friend of God. of God yeah yeah but you know Roman the whole point of Romans eight is talking about how there's now no condemnation in Christ mm -hmm. because the law of the spirit of life um, has has delivered us from the law of sin. And death. And what was the law of sin and death? The law of sin and death was that the mind was captive. So no matter what the person wanted to do, he couldn't do. So now that the law of sin and death is broken, now the mind is subject to God. So now you're a friend of God. So you have that both the the drop the, the charges are dropped. None of our sins can be used against us for each the everlasting judgment. And also, um, our our lives have been washed and sanctified, or justified. So I, I I I take it to mean a judicial meaning first and foremost. But I think underneath that, you can have both you know forgiveness and that issue of you know the conversion being made alive to God. Um, like Titus three says it too. Titus three says, "For you were once." It, living in ignorance but when the grace of in love of god appeared not through works of righteousness which we have done but by the grace of regeneration the washing again saint another metaphor washing and justification come come together through the washing of regeneration and the renewal the renewal mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit in the mind, so that now, and again, this is where I need my New Testament Greek. <laughs> I think that I think that the word "so that" is also not a trans. It's not a transliteration. I think it's literal translation. So that now, being justified by His grace, we should become heirs of the hope of eternal life. So I think that it's judicial in its surface meaning. But underneath the internal logic can have both the forgiveness of sins and this the idea of the mind being renewed through the washing of regeneration. Okay, yeah, let's return. I would love to return to that that point. Um, yeah. So the two points there being First Corinthians five. Um, yeah, I'll pencil. I'll pencil those points in so that way we can return to it. That'd be um, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we'll and we'll connect again and and see if we can schedule this again. I'm sure that when we get enough people watching, um, and and we'll get some reviews, um, they're definitely going to want to hear us continue because I think that you're very astute. It looks like you've done your homework on this, um, so I really appreciate that. Yeah. All right, Sean. Well, um, let's end the broadcast. We'll talk briefly afterwards, and then we'll call it a night. Sounds good.